ODSTs, or Orbital Drop Shock Troopers, are a special operations division in the UNSC. They are known for their commando attitude and their iconic means of entering a battlefield. They deploy via the SOEV drop pods from a UNSC ship in low orbit. This method comes with inherently high risks, as they are often deployed behind enemy lines to clear landing zones for larger task forces, or to reinforce currently in situ allied forces and execute pinch manoeuvres to surround enemies. ODSTs are basically the halo equivalent of the modern day SAS or Navy SEALs, but with the added dimension of space, vacuum, and trans atmospheric operations to complicate matters. It has been said that it takes a special kind of crazy to be an ODST. But what does it take to be an ODST? Hey everyone, welcome back to Installation 00, and today we're looking into the ODSTs and just what is involved in becoming an ODST. They're one of the most recognisable outfits from the UNSC, and their matte black body armour and hardened special operations attitude has earned them a significant reputation across both the UNSC, owing them the moniker Helljumpers, and a reputation that is noteworthy for the member species of both the Covenant and the Banished as well. We all know that Spartans are referenced as being called demons to both the Covenant and the Banished, due to just how dangerous Spartans are and the fact that they can cut through swathes of alien forces. And whilst normal humans, including the Marines, are looked upon as simply human vermin, ODSTs have earned themselves the moniker Imps, in line with the Spartans' demon moniker. Owing to their sheer tenacity, strategic and tactical prowess, and their aggressive assault style mode of engagement. But becoming an ODST isn't just as simple as basically signing up, the ODSTs are actually an entirely voluntary outfit, and for good reason. The risks involved in becoming an ODST are immense, well above operational normal for other branches of the UNSC military. And due to the nature of the operations that the ODSTs partake in, Although surviving is never a guarantee in warfare, ODSTs rate significantly worse in life expectancy than other divisions of the UNSC. But volunteering isn't enough to guarantee you a place. You can't sign up to be an ODST fresh out of college. You actually have to be in the UNSC military enlisted already because you can't volunteer unless you're already serving in the line of duty. But even then, that doesn't guarantee you a tryout. ODSTs are a component of the UNSC Marine Corps. They are elite special operations who specialise in transorbital support interdiction tactics and special operations. The UNSC Navy's Naval Special Warfare Command, of which the Commander-in-Chief of the Office of Naval Intelligence is the commanding officer, is the branch beneath which the ODSTs are seated and they are special operations and elite forces to the nth degree. Upon volunteering, assuming that you are accepted, and you might not just be accepted at face value, you must also tender a transfer from whatever branch of the UNSC military you are currently with to the ODST branch within NavSpecWeb. So if you're in the army, you have to transfer to the navy and then the subcategory of NavSpecWeb. So while the ODSTs are part of the Marine Corps, they are an authority of Naval Special Warfare Command. But again, it's not as easy as just volunteering. ODSTs are recruited from special operations units within the UNSC Marine Corps, the UNSC Army and Air Force and Navy, and all UEG member nations standing militaries. This basically means that you're selected due to your performance in your chosen Military Occupational Speciality, or MOS. And by this, it means you have to be performing in your chosen Military Occupational Speciality well above the average for other soldiers in your unit. Since all ODST candidates are selected in this way, every candidate is also a veteran from other Spec Ops outfits. 
and only those performing well above the average are granted the opportunity to try out. So you not only have to already be in the UNSC military in some regard, but you also have to be performing above average in your MOS and be part of a special operations unit within your MOS and branch of the military before your voluntary is even looked at sideways. But let's say hypothetically you tick all of those boxes and you're accepted into the ODST candidate training program. Now what? I'll tell you what. Three solid weeks of physical training to get your fitness level up to the ODST standards. You might have had fitness levels that have been pressed upon you and you've been training to keep your fitness level at that point within your special operations of your current military branch, but I guarantee you that it is lacking when compared to the ODSTs. These three solid weeks of PT include daily runs, push-ups, obstacle courses, weight and strength training, endurance training, and benchmark testing to ensure you have the basic physical strength and endurance and mindset to be an ODST. So these various training regimes are intense in and of themselves, but are often also performed after little to no sleep, pushing the candidate into sleep deprivation and limiting rations to keep them hungry and in constant discomfort to test their mental aptitude. Obstacle courses can include training sims in all environments, including harsh deserts, artificial snowy tundras, high altitude operations, and even simulations in low or zero G environments. And in these circumstances, oxygen deprivation is even occasionally employed. In many of these training operations, trainees are forced to crawl for miles in various hazardous environments ranging from jungles and forests to war-torn urban environments with barbed wire and rubble and drill instructors firing rounds inches above their heads to increase the level of discomfort. Trainees are encouraged to jump from very high objects to acclimate themselves to the sensation of falling and condition their bodies to deal with large impacts. We'll get to that shortly, and even this can have some knock-on effects to whether or not you're viable for ODST training. If you can't tolerate the three weeks of solid PT and conditioning, candidates can, and do, drop out or are removed by the trainers. In situations where the candidate is removed by the trainers, it often involves some degree of injury or just inability to keep up with the speed and intensity that is expected from the ODSTs. In these circumstances, the candidate's voluntary position is revoked and results in an RTU, or a return to unit, which sends the candidate back to their previous unit and post, which carries with it a severely negative and humiliating reputation, such that the ODSTs themselves consider this to be a fate worse than death. This leads would-be ODSTs to attempt to hide injuries or continue through them regardless in hopes of still making the cut, in spite of these actions possibly causing further pain, injury, or illness. Candidates will often refuse to accept these injuries are limiting to the point that they're not meeting the requisites for being an ODST and have to be forced into an RTU. But this also doesn't mean that there aren't ODSTs currently serving who were immensely injured during their training, but persevered and showed immense endurance and will high enough to still secure themselves a position. And these individuals are particularly tough ODSTs, often transferring to the ODST's 105th division, known to be the most notable, most proud, best trained, most brutal, and finest ODSTs of the ODST branch. Following this, candidates begin squad tactics training where teamwork becomes priority. In this stage, candidates are given full ODST armor with live fire weapons loaded with tactical training rounds, a specialized training round that has a polymer shell to maintain the same attitude as a real bullet in flight, but with a proximity fuse to dissolve the bullet four inches from the target. The round then turns into a red paint that contains a powerful anesthetic capable of knocking a target unconscious altogether depending on the area hit and how many rounds make contact. The rounds also activate a nanofiber weave in the training clothing, causing them to harden, meaning the target loses the function of the given limb or extremity that took the shot. Candidates are dropped at the base of mountains and told to summit it, and any candidate not moving fast enough is shot in the leg, giving them a severe handicap. Any candidate still moving too slowly can and will be shot in the other, forcing them to crawl to the top. 
This kind of training can and will be performed numerous times during the squad tactics training, with added difficulty modifiers including going up against opponents during the climb. This is performed to coax the candidates into working together more effectively. Some candidates will serve as decoys or distractions to draw fire and sacrifice themselves so that others may flank and subdue their opponents. After squad training, the candidates are given tactical training. This involves putting the candidates into smaller fire teams. Similar training simulations are implemented whereby the fire teams come to rely upon each other. The up to five man fire teams would learn each other's strengths and weaknesses and begin to coordinate their efforts in combat sims, mountain summit training and similar scenarios before squad tactics are once again reintroduced to synchronize the various disparate fire teams into a larger cohesive squad with multiple teams therein capable of performing dedicated tasks and operations. After all this intense training, assuming you survived and weren't weeded out or left of your own accord, you finally become an ODST. The problem here is that the ODST's life expectancy is demoralizingly short. Before you even reach the battlefield, you must be deployed in a SOEV drop pod, which are extremely hazardous methods of insertion into the battlefield. Not many people like the idea of being fired out of a spaceship towards a planet and then slamming into the ground planet side and then immediately hopping out into battle, so it does take a very particular type of crazy. This method of insertion carries with it all the problems of high altitude, low opening parachute drops, vacuum operations, atmospheric re-entry, oxygen deprivation, rocketry, terminal velocity, high speed landing and high G deceleration. Pods could fail to launch, in which case you're stuck on the ship while the rest of your unit go and fight, something they most definitely won't thank you for. Your pod could accidentally depressurize immediately following the launch, killing you due to the exposure to vacuum. Or your pod could hypothetically hit other objects in space, either getting hit by smaller pieces of debris that puncture into the pod and potentially puncture you, or worse still, you get hit by a much larger object, like a ship. During re-entry, the heat shielding could fail, causing you to burn alive. The air brake could fail when you're deeper in the atmosphere, meaning your velocity is too high as you approach your rocket thrust altitude, meaning you hit the ground too hard and break bones, or worse, your spine or neck upon impact. Or worse, both the air brake fails and the rocket fails, in which case you hit the floor at terminal velocity, a scenario that occurs often enough that it's been given its own name digging your own grave. Even if everything goes fine, pods can still impact hard enough to damage the door mechanism, causing it to fail to open. Then you're either a sitting duck or you're found by the enemy and killed before you can even get out of your pod. Assuming you have a successful drop, the second the door opens, you are behind enemy lines. You could be shot before you even get out of your pod. And assuming you do get out of your pod, you have to retrieve your weapons from the pod's weapon holsters before you can actually return fire. And even if you manage all of this, you are behind enemy lines with no backup and are expected to clear an LZ or execute a pinch maneuver and hope that that works and that you can rendezvous with friendly units. And then, and only then, can you partake the actual objectives of your mission which come with all of the usual risks of ground combat and warfare. And it's on the assumption that you get through all of that, you actually get to go home, which is often the ship that's orbiting above you, to do it all again tomorrow. It's actually due to this demoralizingly small life expectancy as to why officers within the ODSTs are so immensely respected. Because if you're an officer, it means you've done countless drops and insertions, countless operations and survived every step of the way. You've survived long enough to get promoted, and that's an achievement. It's because of this that all ODST officers, and I do mean all ODST officers, rise from within the ranks. And all ODST officers carry this experience into battle with them and use it to uplift the ODSTs in their command and will put in equal effort as their subordinates. All ODST officers live by the lead from the front ethos and are willing to do anything that they'd ask their subordinates to do. Even during the actual launch in a drop pod, the commanding officer's pod will accelerate out ahead of the other pods, ensuring they're the first on the battlefield. It's the very inherent risk 
that the ODST detachment runs on a day-to-day -day basis that make them so elite, so specialised, and so respected. And if you think you could go through all of that and still be an ODST, well, you're one tough son of a bitch. And until next time... Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider smashing the like button and leave a comment below on what you'd like me to cover next. Big shout out to my patrons Spartan10148, the Metarch of my installation, Falcon, Prophet Bear, Mikhail, Sophia, and Ashley, my dutiful monitors, Darian, Scarab, Spartan0137, Anthony, Ghost, Aaron, Chris, Jacob, Sean, Element Zero, Somatic, Jordan J3, Dan, Mr. Keys, Directal, Gunslinger, Jacob, Bandmill, Echo, Evermore, Officer Cat, and Personal Devil my diligent sub-monitors, my fleet of strato-sentinels, and my loyal enforcers. And all the other patrons who have jumped aboard to support the channel, it means more to me than I can accurately put into words. Another shout out to my Tier 0 Transcendent YouTube members, Spartan137, Jacob, Schmitty, Talia, Fenrir, and Born Stella and all the other YouTube members keeping my installation running on that glorious vacuum energy. Shout out to John for, I don't fucking know. And if you want more of this kind of content, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you don't miss any future videos, and consider jumping aboard yourself as a patron or YouTube member to keep the channel alive and kicking. Thanks again for watching, take it easy everyone, and find peace in the domain.